you for that warm and generous introduction. Chancellor of African Leadership College, the Honorable Mama Gressa Marshall, Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Glasgow Caledonian University, Professor Mike Mannion, Vice Chancellor and Provost of African Leadership College, Dr. Nthlantla Twala, Ms. Don Anderson, Mr. Alan Nesbitt, Glasgow Caledonian University, respected faculty, staff, and students of the African Leadership College, parents, friends, and family of the graduates and graduates, graduates and graduates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this memorable graduation today. And to demonstrate my gratitude, I'll sing for you. If you know the song, please sing along. Another turning point of fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and don't ask why. It's not a question, but a lesson learned in time. It's something unpredictable, but in the end, that's right. I hope you had the time of your life. <clears throat> Thank you. I probably shouldn't sing, really, because I'm a rapper. You know, a rapper who doesn't sing. However, Green Day's Good Riddance, also known as Time of Your Life, is rather the classic graduation anthem many people blast as they appreciate their magnitude of the decisions that lay ahead of them, a fork in the road. Via left or continue right, the red pill or the blue pill. Today, I would like to challenge that metaphor in your head perhaps a bit and replace it with this. Okay, uh-huh, life is like a roundabout. If you miss an exit, you can take the next. It's not the next, it does. Sit back, relax, take a look around, relapse, take a look back around. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> this image of a roundabout with many possible exits might be overwhelming to some unlike the fork in the road with just two or three options. But given that Mauritius is literally made of a thousand roundabouts, <laughs> each with a dozen exits, I think you can all relate. As you graduate today, you might be wondering, go to grad school or work for a bank, become a soldier or teach, start a company or enter public service, go back home, or travel the world. Which, in fact, begs me to ask a few questions myself. A show of hands, please, if this applies to you. How many of you want to go to graduate school? Uh, not because your parents insist you should, but because you want to get a deeper knowledge in an area of a study you're curious about. As many hands. How many of you want to be an entrepreneur or start a company? A lot more hands. How many of you want to become politicians? Okay, that's a handful of you, four or five. I bet you were all excited when they told you some politician will come and speak to you today. It's okay, I won't talk politics. I met the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Education yesterday, and she graciously handled that for you. She and I spoke politics, the politics of transforming education in Africa. One final question. How many of you still don't know what you want to do? It's OK. I'm sure you're thinking, but there are so many things to consider before I make the perfect decision. 
Yes, and even more so after the type of immersive, hands-on, project-based, innovative education you've received here at ALC over the last few years. The options are no longer either or. And I bet the questions around each life decision are as numerous as the Mauritian sugarcane stocks around your campus. What do your parents think? I mean, what can they even think? They won't understand. What about your friends? What will they do? Money? How much is enough? Is impact and passion really that important when one is trying to raise a family? Shouldn't we all be making money for our unborn children's college fees? What's the right experience to gather now if you want to become president in 30 years? And perhaps, top of your mind today as you walk up here to get your degrees, did I even study the right thing after all? Whatever the question is that you're asking yourself now, I have some news for you. This won't be the last time you ask it. The adults in your life may not often tell you this, but we too are asking the same questions we asked ourselves several decades ago. Same questions you're asking yourself now. You know, I wish somebody told me this when I was in college so I didn't have to stress so much about making the perfect decision at that time. So I hope today you'll please allow me to share parts of my story for you to use only as an analogy for yours. It's not a life manual, but these are perspectives that you might find useful. We're not the same, and we could never be. In fact, if I go back in time now, I probably won't take the same decisions I've made leading up to today. I might just take different exits at the different roundabout time I encounter. There are five principles I need you to remember at the end of today, and I will quiz you at the end, so listen. One, whatever you decide to do, be really, 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 really good at it. You, can, you have to master it so you can apply it now and in the future. If you choose to take the exit at a roundabout that reads the north, after this graduation, you have to follow it through for a while. In Mauritius, you will hit a perfect beach up north to contemplate your next move, but in this life's journey, it might take you somewhere else. My PhD thesis was in prosthetics. I have a few patents in the design of comfortable prosthetic interfaces for amputees. My mission then was to develop something that patients could use in Sierra Leone. So when I graduated from MIT, picked up a job with IBM Research and Data Science and moved to Nairobi, many wondered, what are you doing with your life, David? Did you study the right thing? Why did you invest all this time in mastering something that you won't pursue? but I kept in touch with my advisor, and most importantly, the science. I often mentor students from around the world who are interested in the topic. I lecture at the university in Sierra Leone and try to still continue learning. Last month, 17 years later, in the same National Rehabilitation Center in Freetown, Sierra Leone, where I first declared that mission to design state-of-the-art prosthetic devices for Sierra Leoneans, I hosted my professor and thesis advisor, Hugh Herr, as we engaged patients who would benefit from that better prosthetic design through the MIT Bionic Center. Of course, there are people who know about the field better than I know now, but my deep knowledge then, with that knowledge, I can still help shape projects that align with my original vision. 
Two, there's hardly a wrong move. It's just a move, another move that you learn from. If you're unsure what your exit at the roundabout is, drive slowly and check out the other exit signs ahead because you can always look back around. Be curious and comfortable with exploration. At IBM Research, I developed several other patents and got deeper into data science as I entered a new field. For me, I always wanted to be in Sierra Leone. But when I boarded that flight to Nairobi, Kenya with my family instead of Freetown, Sierra Leone after graduating, I knew it was a journey I would learn tremendously from. We developed award-winning technology at IBM, which we deployed in healthcare in Sierra Leone. When I graduated from college, one of my dreams was to contribute to and serve in the public sector at home. So by the time I hopped back on the plane and looped back around to Freetown, Sierra Leone, as the nation's first chief innovation officer to set up the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation, DSTI, all that AI and data science and research management skills I had learned at IBM in my first exit became critical. From a one-person organization in 2018, today DSTI is made up of 80 or so young and passionate full-time and part-time staff who are building some of the most exciting digital public goods in the country and impacting millions of lives. Three, be authentically your full selves. It sounds hard in a world of prejudice, but if the goal is to reach your fullest human potential, then that won't happen if you can't be yourselves. People always give me a second look when they hear I'm the minister in charge of education, a sector that takes 22% of our nation's budget in Sierra Leone. A gold-tinted, dreadlocks, young man wearing khakis and sneakers? Nah. But then, when they hear I rap too, that sets them off. He must not be serious. I rap because I enjoy it. I first started when I joined my elder brother and his friends in clubs at age 10. I rapped through grad school. So when I recorded my album during the COVID lockdown, I sent it first to the president to listen. He's never ever questioned my looks or my looks, for which I'm grateful. And I this last week at the African Union, after chairing a session that he was on, he asked me when next I'll release a song. What he didn't know was that I'd actually scheduled studio time last weekend for a song about him, which was released on Friday. I'm lucky because the president has provided me the platform to question and shape culture by being my full self. I won't take sole credit for it, but there are probably dozens of people in public offices and senior private sector director positions with dreadlocks in today in Sierra Leone. The jokes have evolved from dreadlocks people smoking weed to needing dreadlock precedents. On the, on the back of a keke or tuk-tuk, you know those tricycles in Freetown, there's a message that reads, if a Rasta can be Minister of Education, one day dot, dot, dot. When we are ourselves, we expand space for others so they too can be themselves. So can you do your art, fashion, write a book, and rap while in public office? If Rasta can be Minister of Education, what can't you do? Four, our best people must do politics and do public service. 
not many good young people aspire to be in public service. I don't know why, but there are not many ways to drive impact than in the public sector. Today in Sierra Leone, everyone knows the expression radical inclusion. My first book, out in May this year, is named Radical Inclusion, Seven Steps to Help You Create a More Just Workplace, Home and World. The day I took my oath of office as minister in 2019, the president, from a podium like this, looked into my eyes and reaffirmed government's position to ban pregnant girls from attending school. It seemed like everyone was with him. I initially thought about quitting, but with a group of technical experts, we set out to change the minds of the president and the entire country that education must be fully inclusive of all, including pregnant girls and parent learners. Five months later, the policy changed. And today, we have one of the most inclusive education policies in the world. Look, I probably will be, you know, impacting the world in one way or another if I wasn't in, public in the public sector. But when I see a student who would otherwise not have been in school if I hadn't been the minister to help drive a policy change, it reaffirms my belief that many of our best, that many of the best of us, must be in public service too. And for the fifth lesson today, there's no way to do the hard stuff without getting through the hard stuff. If you believe in religious diversity, equal pay for men and women, girls' education, human rights, and whatever social cause you stand for, you have to do the hard work to get it done. No one ever changed the world by just complaining without marching, fighting, voting, and serving. The hard stuff is hard. I won't lie to you but it has to get done. I get all kinds of abuse, threats, sleepless nights, loss of family time because of my work. But there's nothing different um, I will be doing today than doing this hard stuff. My vision for the next few years is to eliminate learning poverty in Sierra Leone every child in school. And yes, we also want zero out of school children. Every child in school must have the basic foundational learning competencies of computational thinking, comprehension, and civics, so they too can fulfill their fullest potentials. If you want to help, come to Freetown and join my team. There's plenty of hard stuff to do. We do have lovely bitches too, and that helps. I know I said I had five things for you to remember. Be really good at whatever you decide to do. There's no wrong exit. You can learn from everything. Be authentically your full selves. Do politics. Do public service. And do the hard stuff. But really, if you must remember one thing today, it's something I only learned myself last week. When I joined government, I was told I didn't have the right credentials for it. I was too young. I wouldn't be able to manage the education sector. I didn't know politics, they said. Then last week, I won the best minister award at the World Government Summit. And these same people only dug their heels deeper in their beliefs. That's when it hit me. There's no point in trying to prove that someone is wrong about you. If they're wrong now, they'll probably continue to remain wrong no matter what you do. They can't know you better than you know yourself. 
I realize that there are, other, there are others who believe in me too. The president gave me a chance to serve. He's a great mentor, and we must all surround ourselves with mentors. My team supports my crazy ideas. They say you're only as good as your team. My family and friends challenge my thinking to make it better. They all believe in me. So my goal now is to try to prove them right. There are many people who believe in you, including yourself. Let's prove ourselves right. And if we're wrong, sorry, I said there are no wrong exits. We will look back around at the next roundabout and find the right exit. Congratulations and thank you.